Hello everyone, this is Tim. Welcome to North and South Podcasts. Hope you're okay. This is going to be a, a well-being podcast and it's just me talking today and I hope you get something out of it. I also hope that I remember to turn WhatsApp off so that you don't get those beeps during the podcast which has just happened. And I think I'll leave this in as a reminder to myself. I hope you're all doing okay. As you know, I have been doing this now for nearly a year, believe it or not. Time flies when you're having fun. I really enjoy doing it. I like being creative. I like speaking to people. I like trying to share ideas and passions with people. If you want to get involved on any level, please do. Please like, share, subscribe. Please, if you can, contribute financially on coffee.com. The price of a cup of coffee once a month makes a huge difference and keeps this going as a an independent venture. As you know, I am on YouTube and Spotify. Follow me there. I'm now on TikTok. So if you can support me on TikTok, details are in the notes as well. Spread the word. Anyway, I'm going to talk to you today about a, a few ideas that have been building up over the last few months. I've, I've wrote some of these down and I want to just talk to you about them. The first one is about um, religion and spiritualism. Now, some people say that, you know, I'm not religious because I don't believe like the kind of things I hear when I go to a church or when I read a particular religious book. Uh, I'm on board with that. I really struggle with the idea that you believe in these religious books to the nth degree and you follow what those books say, etc. I think those books can be used very, very poorly. I think they can also be used well and all points in between. But I find it very hard to accept all doctrine from organisations such as churches, etc. But saying that, I find it very hard to accept all doctrine from any real organisation. I do believe in human freedom and human choice. And although we need conventions and rules and structures and hierarchies to a degree, it's important that we don't let those bind us or blind us too much but that's another wormhole that I won't go down I want to talk to you today about the Buddha now I'm not really someone who would describe themselves as a Buddhist but I am quite spiritual I am interested in Taoism Buddhism and I do do meditation and some people think meditation is a religious thing and if not quite a religious thing it's a spiritual thing and I'm not sure I entirely agree with that. I think that you can be a complete atheist and find meditation valuable. And I do subscribe to Sam Harris's Waken Up app, which I think costs around $80 or £80 English pounds per year. Mind you, it's the same thing now, isn't it, with the pound falling so much against the dollar because of the uncertainty around the new government's approaches to the economy which has upset everyone including Tories and classical economists so since 2016 probably since before then the idea that the Conservatives are the party of the stable economy is no longer true but that's a slightly different thing which I don't want to go down the path of in today's podcast but Buddhism is a religion but it's also a way of life and I like the idea of a religion also being a way of life and about positive actions in the world and not necessarily a belief in the supernatural. Dalai Lama wrote a great book a few years ago about why people should pursue a very moral life. And he spent most of the book, I forget what the book was called now, advocating morality in your day-to-day -day life. And then at the end, did he say why he preferred Buddhism? He didn't kind of say that one religion was better than another etc etc and I think that's important that religions are open and they're not too doctrinaire about things but the Buddha was around in the 5th or 6th century BC his name was Siddhartha Gautama although there's different ways of saying his name and pronouncing his name and apparently this guy who became known as the Buddha achieved complete enlightenment which means wisdom understanding knowledge and insight into things so got to a, a mental state whereby he had arrived in understanding the world around him 
This was also based on freedom from ignorance, craving and suffering, which isn't to say that you're not at times ignorant, that you do not at times crave and that you do not at times suffer because they're all part of human life and human nature, but it's about managing them, okay? And like all religions or ideas or positive ideas, it's about how you use these ideas and implement them and share them with other people. Now, what the Buddha worked out is this idea of a, a middle way because the Buddha was born very, very wealthy and powerful and he was meant to be a future prince, king of a realm, leader of a realm. And his dad was a bit worried and wanted to protect him from the outside world to make sure that he ended up as this strong king and so that all the uncertainties of the external world were kept away from him. Now, the Buddha worked out through being very powerful and wealthy and rich as a youth and then by going out into the world and being very poor that it was best to lead this middle way or middle path which means that you're not too ascetic whereby you have very very little and try and practice discipline and control of your desires and operating on very little you have a middle way between that and indulgence or extreme wealth and in many ways, this is kind of this idea of yin and yang, the belief that we need to find balance and harmony between things, that we shouldn't be too extreme in our pursuits, that we need to find a, a comfortable balance between things to lead the optimum life, as it were. Now, the Buddha did this through ethical training, believed that this balance would come from ethical training and also through meditative practices such as mindfulness which means being aware of things as they happen around you and also within you so acknowledging that a thought is a thought acknowledging that you interpret your thoughts and you interpret the world and ultimately you've got control over your thoughts and your actions now this isn't to say that you deny the emotion you will have emotional stirrings within you but you process and manage those emotions before you act upon them and I've been doing a, an online course by a guy called Paul Cope. And Paul Cope wrote a book called How to Solve Any Problem in Your Life. And I'm going to be speaking to Paul in a future podcast. And part of Paul Cope's work is this idea that you note emotions, you process them, and you keep a discipline and a control about who is the sub-personality, who is on the mic, as Paul calls it, who's in control. And it's quite similar to what the Buddha advocated, you know, well over 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago. But I can't tell you how useful I found Paul Cope's work. Uh, he is a fantastic, fantastic uh, understander. And if you like, he creates a, a holistic approach towards managing emotions and becoming better people. So anyway, the... Buddha acknowledged that suffering was part of life. Um, one of the founding things that Buddha realized is that you must accept three things. And this is the basis before you move on to realizing other aspects of enlightenment. And they are that suffering exists, in particular through three forms that we cannot avoid. Death will happen. And in many ways, enlightenment is about being ready for death and being prepared for death and being accepting of death before it actually comes. To live each day as if it's your last. To live each day mindful of the fact that you will no longer be here in the future, which a lot of the Stoics advocated as well, remembering that you will die at some point and making sure that you appreciate that and let that inform your decisions because it makes you a better decision maker in knowing about your mortality moment to moment. Also, two other things. Now, you might die before you experience these two other things, but the Buddha said that we must accept sickness. And there are going to be times in your life when you and your loved ones and people around you are going to be sick to varying degrees. And that can be very unpleasant, but we need to be able to accept it, challenge it, and don't let it become worse than what it is. Don't make things worse. 
and keep positive about the fact that you are suffering and say, how can I deal with this? Because we know that people with often fatal diagnoses can live longer with positive mindsets. There's a lot of evidence to support that in a lot of studies which have been done in recent years. Also, old age, you are going to get old and people around you are going to get old and people around you are going to get sick and die. And it's about appreciating that and understanding it and accepting it and not letting those things terrify you or be too scared of them to become in harmony with them and to even steer them more positively towards recovery and betterment. And I think that's a very, very important thing. I once heard the famous mindfulness teacher and meditation expert John kabat say that even if you're on the deathbed there's something for you to work on to improve to get better at because each day is important and I think that that is certainly something that we should aspire to. Now mindfulness meditation mindfulness is just about staying calm and centered it's about appreciating moments it might be like just looking at the sunrise and going, well, that's a nice moment. Or it might be in the thick of a difficult situation, staying equanimous. I've done a podcast on equanimity a few months ago about staying calm in difficult situations. That can require, well, it does require training and it also requires spiritual development and personal development. And staying calm in any situation is a big asset. I might have mentioned this story before, but Ulysses S. Grant, who later became U.S. President, he was once woken during the American Civil War. He was a a Union general. And he was woken up at two in the morning because there'd been a surprise attack by the Greys, the Rebels, the Confederacy. And apparently he was woken up at 2 a.m. in his tent and um, he was given some information about this night attack. And he stayed very calm. And he asked for coffee to be made and he listened to everyone that spoke to him and he considered what to do, didn't rush it, and then calmly said, right, is what I want us to do. And it's about that level-headedness. It's about being that calm person, that authoritative person who would be the calm person on a boat in a difficult situation when everyone else gets upset and starts losing their heads, staying calm and centred and think on what is the best way to deal with this situation. And that requires training, and it requires management of your emotions. Another way of managing your emotions is keeping away from what you might deem emotional porn. And by emotional porn, I'm talking about things that are literally just designed to wind you up, to appeal to your animal brain, and to excite you in ways which... Are not good. So for me, I, I just need to watch an excerpt from Fox News or GB News and see that that's news that's appealing to people's kind of fear of the other, the animal brain inside people. But I then have my animal brain triggered by seeing basically what I would call appalling behavior on those kind of news channels. Another example is the Daily Mail. Now, the Daily Mail allegedly is a newspaper that has been accused, allegedly, of uh, having far more mistruths in it than all the papers, even the red tops. And some of the headlines I see when I go into a newspaper store and see it on the fronts of certain newspapers, you just think, how can anyone buy that nonsense? Now, those newspapers appeal to what I would call lowest common denominator politics. However... You shouldn't have a lowest common denominator reaction to those appeals to lowest common denominator people on the other side, if you like, with opinions that you may or may not agree with. And it's about being aware of that, but not letting it bother you so much that it allows negativity to rise in you. Be aware of it, but don't let it dominate you. And equally, with news and media, and particularly social media, you shouldn't let those kind of things dominate you because they bring out the worst in people. Twitter's probably the worst one for me online. The ridiculous, 
ridiculous behaviour of people on Twitter where that like inner critic, inner voice, that nasty Machiavellian inner voice, it's literally people print that on Twitter and have a go at each other. And it's just a fool's errand. It's like Sisyphus with them rocks that he kept trying to get out of that pit in Greek legend and he just kept sending more rocks down there. Don't buy that nonsense and get involved in that game. Get out of it. Keep away from things which are bad for you. Keep away from it and control your environment. If other people want to do all that stuff and believe all that stuff and read those papers and watch them channels, that's down to them. Don't you be getting wound up by it. Okay, so it's about equanimity, keeping calm and avoiding things that attempt to wind people up because you then get wound up with the fact that those people are getting wound up in that way. No good. Equally, if you haven't got something constructive to say or something useful to say, just stay out of it. Don't get involved. Stay calm. Be the bigger person. Rise above it. It doesn't mean you don't state your opinion and you're not assertive. But it just means that you know what battles you should be fighting and whether it's worth getting embroiled in things that are just going to unsettle you and throw you off balance and off kilter. Now, when it comes to mindfulness, I've spoken about mindfulness, bef mindfulness before, mindfulness techniques, that just being aware of the present moment, being calm, breathing in and out five times, using your five senses, what can you see, hear, smell, touch and taste. Just to centre yourself. I do another thing called this like Kundalini chant, which I do, which is something I learned through yoga. Yoga I find is really helpful with mindfulness as well when I'm doing yoga and the breathing, etc. But meditation requires discipline and it is tough. And there are a lot of good apps out there. There are a million things that you'll find to do ahead of meditation. And I started meditating during lockdown and I really struggled. I'd flirted with meditation for years and you keep saying, oh, I haven't got time for this. I don't find it useful. But basically it means just closing your eyes, spending time focusing on the breath and centering yourself. And you do get better at it and you are calmer because of it. And you do then interpret the world differently as a result of it. And I can't stress enough how calming I find meditation in impacting on my general life as well. So, Meditation is a gateway that helps you become more meditative generally through your day-to-day -day life, not just while you're meditating. So even if I'm in work, I'll do 10 minutes meditation in the morning. I've got a couple of apps. If you're going to do it, it's better to get an app because it gives you that discipline and that extra support early on in centering yourself and staying calm. And also achieving breakthroughs while you're doing it, like seeing things and imagining things or imagining an issue and calmly thinking about it and sometimes when you're meditating you get these little breakthroughs and ideas on how to deal with life better but don't be expecting miracles when you're meditating the practice is often quite difficult and it requires you persevering and showing discipline in calming the mind down refocusing when you start thinking about things and just focusing on the breath but it is good and I can't recommend enough meditation we can all think of a million reasons not to do it I do it in the mornings so if I'm in work I do 10 minutes before I go to work it's hard finding that 10 minutes if I'm off I'll do 20 minutes sometimes I'll do longer meditations but you do enter a deep relaxing state when the inner chat and inner dialogue calms down when I first started, I would need 15, 20 minutes to, to get to that calm state. Now I sometimes need to meditate for longer. But it's very nice. You're kind of aware, but there's no chit-chat coming across your mind. It's a very, very strange feeling, but it's very, very relaxing to be there and to not have that constant inner critic going on at you. So get meditating. Check the Calm app. I use the Calm app and I use the Sam Harris app and that gives you meditational direction. I think the Calm app is £25, I think, for a year subscription around that region. Also, if you have trouble sleeping, you wake up in the night, you've got meditations to help you get back to sleep, which I've found useful in the past as well. Meditation is not easy. It does require a bit of discipline, and you do need to persevere. 
But that is one way that the Buddha helped to understand the world through meditation and reflecting on the nature of reality and on the nature of life, human nature, etc., etc. The medieval historian and I would say general public intellectual Noah Harari, who's wrote several great books, including Homo Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, meditates for two hours a day. And he says that allows him to see the world for what it is and to see a lot of what we do when we behave a certain way, just as stories and things that we've internalised, rather than being things which are actually true and real. And about understanding the difference between what we actually do need and the things that we just do because that's what others do, because that's what's accepted, and to try and control the latter with the former. So I would recommend going on a meditation journey if you haven't quite got there. It's something I'm very passionate about and very interested in, and it's something that I've got through doing yoga and being interested in Buddhism. And it's about appreciating and preparing yourself for difficult situations and then dealing with them in a calm way. And also about not getting too carried away by the good things that happen in life, to appreciate them, but not to get too carried away and over the top and too excitable about things, to just get that middle way and that middle path. Cool, so that's my little chat about Buddhism. And as you can see there, I covered a few things. Um, meditation and the idea of equanimity managing social media etc so think about what you do can you meditate can you get an app to get you started do you feel like you have a mind that is constantly on the go do you need to relax a little bit more maybe meditation can help for you and if necessary, think about what the Buddha said about finding that balanced middle way between having nothing and having everything. Um, again, there's a lot of studies showing that people who have lots of money aren't necessarily that happy, which isn't necessarily because having lots of money is a bad thing, but because people think that the things that will make them happy don't actually matter that much compared to things like family and friendships and nature and new experiences which we can actually access without having lots and lots and lots of money behind us. So get meditating, think about your life, start doing an emotional journal uh, each day, write down what went well and what didn't go well and get interested and say, right, what's going on in my mind? What's my mind like? Do I talk properly to myself? Do I need to settle my mind more to meditate? to be mindful, to think to myself, let's talk positively, let's interpret the world through a positive lens. It doesn't mean that we're not assertive, it just means that we try to improve the day-to-day -day reality of our lives. Right, hope you found that useful. Take it easy, let me know what you think, and I'll speak to you soon. See you later.